Good evening. Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Special Program Series. Tonight, it is our pleasure to present Maria Cornejo, who will speak in conversation with our deputy director, Patricia Mears, about her new book, Maria Cornejo Zero. The book is an intimate look at Cornejo's design processes and inspirations, and includes pictures by Mark Bothwick that capture the femininity and artful minimalism of her designs. At the end of the presentation, Ms. Cornejo will sign books on stage. Please join me in welcoming Maria Cornejo and Patricia Mears. Thank you very much, Tanya. And I'm thrilled to have Maria here, and I know you all are thrilled that she's joining us. Um, we are celebrating her book, 20 years of her wonderful company, Zero. Um, it's hard to imagine. I was telling Maria, I remember kind of stalking the store. I uh, remember when it opened in Olita, and it's incredible how far-reaching her work has become. Um, in many ways, the book is very much a personal journey. Um, I think Maria, as you know, is someone who has a great integrity as a designer and as a person, and I think it, it very much reflects her. If you get a chance, I really do encourage you to buy the book, especially those of you who love the process and the sort of background story of how a designer makes clothes. Um, we were talking a little bit about wanting to do more than just a coffee table book. It's not just Maria sitting on a beach in Capri or the latest sort of throw pillows in her home. Um, it really is uh, it, a look inside the very technical as well as emotional process of making clothes. I think for me, one of the things that struck me um, when you look at it is it also is her voice in a lot of ways, although it's visual material. Um, she's one of the most invent inventive and innovative designers working today and is very much connected to the process of making clothes. Um, I think the other thing that comes across is how much the work with your family plays a role in this. Your husband, your children, it's, uh, uh, if you will, almost a collaborative effort with them, Maria. How did the idea for the book come about? Um, the book came about, uh, basically, we were talking with Rizzoli about doing a book, and um, they love my husband's work, and of course they appreciate my work too, so, um, and I really wanted to focus the book on the years that were not online, you know, now everything's online, everything's successful, but there's a, there's a lot of the early years that there's no record of it and the only person that knew what it was was myself so it was a really nice way for the company also to learn about the beginnings and to refocus everything on the principles how it started mm. and um, and, it be, and it started as a family project so uh, over the years it has evolved from family family also to like a bigger work family so that's interesting as yeah, well it's great before we jump in and start talking about the work, and um, I wanted to start with this photograph of you, um, exhausted, as it says, uh, after a long day of work, <laughs> and Maria also walking in the space of her, her first uh, boutique. How did this begin, Maria, for you? Why zero? What is it about your background? How did you get to that point? Um, I like the idea of, st you know, because I did have a collection in the 80s with a, another uh, design partner called John Richmond, and I did do things in Paris. And I wanted Zero was my American story in a way, my New York story. And, and it was me trying to figure out how to find my own way of working in New York with a young family. You know, I just, I remember my daughter was six and a half. My son was eight months old. When I got the space, I was pregnant. My dad was dying of cancer. So it sat empty for a long time, the space. And so for me, it was about finding a new way of cutting, a new way of relating. And for me, also, after living in Paris and working in Japan, working in England, working for big companies and working for myself, I really wanted to refocus it on things that I wanted to do and have control over them. And the whole process, not having to send sketches to China or, or Japan or Italy, but actually be there from the beginning to end and really be happy with the whole evolution of the process, and that's, I think, it's really key. Yeah, I, I think the thing that also strikes you as you go through this book, for those of you who love fashion history, is how Maria, for me, is part of a continuum. 
If you think back to the great Madeleine Vionnet, this revolutionary figure in the early 20th mm -hmm. century, she really created, if you will, the process of draping. She mm -hmm. made it systematic. But as, as a result, Maria, she came up with a new vocabulary of clothing. Mm -hmm. Madame Gray did the same thing. And you're sort of continuing that process. You're very much a contemporary designer. You're clearly living in the 21st century. But do you think that you feel that the technical process, if you will, working mm -hmm. with the fabric is something that is essential to your design process? Yeah, I mean, for me, I is, I'm a bit of a textile nerd. I always say that. And I always uh, start with fabrics first. Yes. And the fabrics dictate the shape. And I think it's, um, and the woman dictates the shape. The fabric dictates the shape. Is I am not sketching like a total for a muse. I'm really sketching like an initial idea. And then we drape it on a body and see how the fabric behaves. So it really is about accentuating a woman's best points and flattering her, yeah. and uh, but from I always say it's, it's deceptively simple because it takes so much work for it to be that simple. Yes, exactly. And the thing is, you've got wonderful geometric shapes, but you made some interesting comments as to why you picked geometry, mm -hmm. why it worked for you. Um, I like the fact that you know it was it's, it was a new way for me to start cutting, you know, and I don't look at books. And now that I've you know as I've evolved, I've seen other designers that have done this in a different way in the early, long time ago. And for me, it was just a way of finding. I moved to New York. I wanted things that were really easy to wear. I wanted um, at the time there was no they would see the clothes that were totally unwearable or there was the gap. And for me, it was about finding that spot where I, I wanted to make interesting clothes, but also have them be wearable and be wearable every day. I mean, now there's a lot of other designers who are doing this sort of thing as far as bridging that gap. Right. Right. But at the time, there wasn't. And I think that was what was interesting and, f and figuring out how, you know, like these simple shapes once put on the body become something. Maria, one of the things that when you talked about sort of the larger concept of family, your clients play an incredibly important role in sort of women in general. Mm -hmm. How do you address this being a woman designer yourself? How do you think it's different than, say, the way men design? Um, I think I'm a little bit more sympathetic to them and the <laughs> fact that we don't all have these perfect size two bodies. Um, and you know, when I started designing the collection, I opened the store, I was, I just had a child and I wanted things that were easy to wear, that were look stylish, that make, could take me from taking my son to school or my daughter to the, going to the office, going to a meeting, going straight to an opening or something. And I think the versatility and the fact that women don't have these lives, that cocoon that you go home and you get dressed up just for an occasion. You. We have like many lives and, and it's about actually being sympathetic to that and making a woman feel good about themselves all the time, you know? How does, even though we're talking a lot about women, there are actually two very important men in your mm -hmm. life, your, your husband, aesthetically, mm -hmm. and you also have a brilliant technical person, Mr. Huang, I think, yes. who does this. What are the roles that they play in your design process? Uh, Mark was very much my freedom. He would say things to me, just make one thing as long as you're happy with it. At the end of the day, you have to be happy with what you're making. And uh, Mr. Wong, he studied with me as a sewer. Then at the time I had uh, a pattern maker called Duncan from New Zealand who was a lot younger and he basically Mr. Wong wanted to start cutting patterns and he started going to night school. So I said to Duncan, why don't you let him trace over your patterns? And he's basically made pretty much every sample for the last 20 years and, and made most of the patterns, the finished patterns. What, what does he say to you? As How do you go back and forth with him on this? Because I find that process... Oh, he always says to me, oh, it's too difficult, too <laughs> difficult. <laughs> no, too difficult. And it's almost like a challenge to him. Yeah. And then we push him and, you know, and then he gets very excited because I have very gorgeous, lovely, talented assistants now, so he gets to work with them as well. So, <laughs> you know, uh, that's the highlight of his day, I think. With me, he goes, oof. So now <laughs> he's... <yeah. laughs> You know, Maria, like he's retiring, so I'm really sad about that. It's sort of a bittersweet yeah. end of year because he will retire this year. Um, one of the things that you and I were talking a little bit about, and I think this is what's so um, identifiable because your hand is in all, all aspects of the design process, but also, Maria, you said you started very small. 
-hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you started with a small idea and how it evolved. Because you've, you're a big company now. You're on two coasts. You sell internationally. Yes, but it started from a very... Um, for me, I wanted to go back to the, uh, having an atelier after working for different companies. And what was important for me was to find a different way of cutting, of making it interesting for me. Because at the time, the fashion business per se didn't interest me. I was like, well, I just, it, would be, it was very formulaic because I was working for big companies. So I wanted to find a way to evolve an idea. And I came up with like the idea of geometry and how these very simple shapes um, I, and basically, I was thinking T-shirts, things that you could wear every day, like jersey. It wasn't anything complicated. I thought, I, and I kept thinking, well, you know, everybody wears jeans, so I should just make things that go back to jeans. And so I, w I started making these shapes, and, and but in very wearable fabrics, nothing too fancy. I mean, I even in the book you can see I was, you know, everybody's doing athlete athlete shirt and stuff, but. I've been doing like fleece since the beginning and you know, things that are wearable and cool. Mm. It doesn't have to stay in the exercise world. If clothes are comfortable, I don't think they should be just sweatpants, you know? Yeah. Um, one of the, my favorite pieces is this incredible wrap that we were looking at that was made out of a fleece blanket from yes. Kmart. So yes. fabric can be found anywhere. But I think the other thing though, Maria, although this is a very trend-oriented mm -hmm. issue and you're ahead of the trend, the process of making clothes actually harkens it back again to kind of the couture idea where you're a designer who evolves. You're not a cut and slash kind of no. designer. One minute, you know, you're doing Russian tsarinas and the next one, skateboarders. You really, <laughs> you, you've created, if you will, a foundation and you've built on this. And do you think, again, the technical process, working with the materials, draping yourself has been the core of what? You yeah, do. and I think more and more, you know, it's an evolution of an idea. Where, you know, one of the things that gets me the most excited is when I work with my team and we come up with ideas. And, you know, and I always say, I, I give you a starting point, but you can take it somewhere and we talk about it and it moves forward and it evolves. And then I come in again and we look at it, things. And it's just, I think for me, um, we, we keep being creative, but, the, you know, there's a body only has four limbs. and a woman needs to be flattered, so it's not like well, all of a sudden we're going to start designing. And and for me also the thing is that's really important. I always thought that I, I did. I mean, there's a lot of clothes that just hang in somebody's wardrobe. For me, that's not interesting. I think and clothes, unless they're lived in and worn, they don't have a life. And and the person who wears infuses that spirit into the clothing. So that's really important to have that. And I think a lot of the clients that we have. They're like amazing, interesting artists or, you know, actresses, uh, you yeah. know, artists, politicians, whatever. Housewives, moms, superstars, but at the end of the day, they're, they're, the clothes become something on them. Yeah. You know, it's about how they put the clothes together, how they behave in the clothes. And I always say I'm cool by association. Yeah. <laughs> because there, there's some really incredible women that wear the clothes, and even in the company, to see all the different girls, different ages, different personalities wearing the clothes, that's what's interesting to me. It's not having a cookie-cutter image of a woman. Does it help having the boutique so that you can get direct feedback from the clients as opposed to working just through the wholesale process? Yes, I mean, I think that was key to get for me to have the atelier, and in the beginning, we were not wholesaling, we had everything there, and, we would make samples and see what people reacted to. And I think it's really interesting to actually see that a lot of times women are far ahead of the curve than the wholesale buyers give them credit for, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. I think, you know, people that are interested in art or fashion, they, they want interesting things. They, they, they know. Yeah. Um, Do you think it's a good business model for someone who has a smaller company or the process where you're dealing directly with the client and you can sort of adjust and, and manipulate things very quickly. Yes, I think so because I think the reality is, like I said, you know, if clothes need to be worn, so unless you have a market, unless you have a client, it doesn't exist. It doesn't just exist as a, as a vague idea of something and the reality is, I always say, you know, when I've judged competitions or something, like at yeah, I did something with Dries and I remember saying to the, especially the female designers, I said, what would you wear out of this? Yeah, 
Africa. Because they would design these incredible things and then they were wearing jeans. I said, well, that's not interesting. So yes. how do you expect me to relate to these clothes if you're not even wearing them yourself? I think there's something to be said for being a female and you have to, you know. Yeah. Well, we've talked a lot about making the clothes and being inspired by textiles, but for me, and I've been watching your show for years and I think others have as well, you really took a quantum leap fairly mm -hmm. recently, Maria, by, by doing prints. A lot mm -hmm. of them are actual photographs that you yeah. had printed. How did this whole process, when did you suddenly say, all right, I'm going to go from basically monochromatic to, to it was print. a way to actually, you know, I, I, I was, I remember getting, it was my iPhone and taking pictures and liking the imagery and the pictures that I was taking, I was blurring and it was just, I thought, oh God, this looks interesting. This looks like a, it would be a cool print. And it, it just came organically. And, and it was a way to add texture uh, and, and color onto these very simple geometric shapes and to make give them another lease of life as well you know and i used to buy prints i used to remember i used to go to some of the jobbers on midtown and buy like african fabrics and make like cocoon shapes in african fabrics so for me it was a way of bringing that joy and energy but having you know and and also to be honest there's there's a whole thing about you know you in america you cannot trademark cutting the way you cut things, which for me is yes. shocking because it's yeah. all about the cutting. Yes. But you can trademark a print on a textile. Oh, very interesting. Oh. So there you go. So all our fabrics, all our prints are originals. But associated with all of this, I think, um, again, what was so refreshing was to see the prints and how beautifully they were done. They were very Maria Cornejo. But one of the things you also said is that you're anti-trend. You were mm -hmm. saying something that if a textile vendor is showing you something that someone bought, you yeah, run the other I mean, way. I mean, especially, you know, uh, in order to have your own voice, you have to, it sounds terrible, but ignorance is bliss. I don't look at fashion magazines. Great. I look at them, you know, at Although the end of a season them. when yeah. the collection's yeah. done, or, yeah. I'll, you know, I'll glance at a stack of things, but I don't really, because I feel like as a designer, ignorance is bliss, and you have to create your own world. You can't be looking at somebody else's world right, if you want to right. be original. Exactly. Maria, I love this particular set of images. Um, can you talk us through this? Oh, this is crazy. This fabric I fell in love with, and then it arrived, and it was pretty stiff. And I remember we were trying to figure out what to make out of it, because it, it was just such a beautiful fabric. It was quite shiny, quite eveningy but it was like almost like padded. So I started messing around with it, and by the end we ended up with this lovely gown, which actually ends up quite looking quite 20s in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And again, I think with all this bias cutting. Yeah, um, but that was, I think it was 2012. Yeah, so it's like five years ago. Right. right. Um, you know, and, and I've had more and more doing evening wear special pieces, but it was really well received, so then it gave it me the courage to sort of push further with some evening wear. Yes. Because what's interesting too is you use thick, very sometimes mm -hmm. very thick angoras and other types of materials, mm -hmm. but you also will do things like this where you will do a collection in white and it looks yeah. like a raw muslin. Yeah. Um, does the season change help you in terms of choosing new fabrics or different ways of approaching it? Yes. Of course, I think, you know, I, even now, I just went in the store before coming here tonight and the resort collection just arrived and it's all about bring, well, look at me uh, like a mechanic, but it's about bringing joy <laughs> when it's getting cold. So the resort collection is not like a beach collection, it's just a lot of color yeah. and pattern and texture. So just when you're getting bored with your black clothes, I always go like, what do I want to wear? And I always go and I go, oh, I have nothing to wear. I hate everything. <laughs> and you know, what will make me want to shop again? Sounds great. Well, I, I, the thing that I particularly love is that you did highlight some of the accessories and your shoes are phenomenal. How did you decide you were going to do this, Maria? And what are your, is your inspiration for footwear? Because it works together, but they are almost incredible products on their own. If you didn't make clothes, they would still sell really well. Yeah, I mean, the thing with the shoes, for me, it's like I always said, you know, I wanted shoes that were comfortable because I have two broken feet. One, when I was pregnant with my son, one like three years ago, I walk a lot. Like most New Yorkers, I walk a lot and I love walking. And for me, it was always about having things that work with the clothes, but also very modern and very 
same principle that are comfortable, but they look cool, they're wearable, but they're interesting. It's just trying to hit all those different things. And right. Did you have to learn orthotics? Did you have to learn the sort of the principles of shoemaking as well? No, you know, we've sort of done a lot of trial there. I have a, a great assistant, Laura, who's been working a lot on the shoes, and we've had consultants to help us with the construction. Uh, in the very beginning, we were collaborating with a shoe designer, and then we started, we brought them back in house. And not a shoe is like very complicated. Yes. It's like, you know, compared to this, which has basically got two fabric and a zipper. Yeah. There's three elements. A shoe can have nine elements. So it's, it's hard work because it's to the millimeter yeah. and it's so precise. Whereas the clothes can be a little bit easier, you know, more laid back. The shoes are like, you have to be <laughs> super precise. How do you feel about color and range? You know, the thing that I love is, I love your neutrals, I really will mm -hmm. say. There's sort of a richness to this, but when you do a pow of color, and uh, your last collection had incredible, the saturated pinks, why are you drawn to those? What is it about those? I, s I think it's energy. I mean, I'm, you know, I wear a lot of color. I'm Latin. I wear a lot of color on holiday or, you know, when I'm working, I don't because I'm usually looking at color and pattern every day. So I don't want to see it on myself. But if I'm out of the office, I do. Um, but I think also color is energy. I mean, let red is, is, is very beautiful. You don't want to wear it every day, but once in a while you do want a red coir coat. Yeah. And then, um, like the pink, you know, I really wanted to bring back the palette of the beginning of the collection. So there was a lot of pink right in the beginning. And they're all laughing at me this year because, you know, I always laugh about baby pink and never, but fuchsia pink I love. <laughs> fuchsia pink I love, and I love red. I, I don't like. Wimpy colors, yeah. There's, yeah. I've always felt there was a lot of power coming from this, yeah. even though we think of it as feminine. Yeah. There's a lot of strength. In fact, Valerie Steele has a major show coming up uh, next year on the color pink. Yeah, fuchsia. So, I love fuchsia pink. Yeah. Maria, you <laughs> made mention great. of being Latin, but your background is so varied. You actually speak four languages. You've been educated. You're originally from Chile. You had to leave, unfortunately. Your family mm -hmm. fled, wound mm -hmm. up in England. You were educated studied fashion there, you worked, you also worked in France. Your husband's British, your children were raised in the US. Does yeah. this international perspective um, find its way into the basic elements of your design process? I think, I don't know, you tell me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a mutt. I lived in Paris, so I always say that my, my chic side comes from Paris. My sense of humor comes from England. Uh, the easiness of wearing things comes from New York because it's where I really found my voice. And, you know, in Chile, like, a lot of the geometry and color. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's all different influences. It's, it's a bit of a fusion. fusion. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing that I love about a lot of this, Maria, is the concept of easy travel. Because, mm -hmm. again, it, we need to do you know, day to day running to the office. But also, so many people now have to throw clothes into a suitcase and run. A carry on. <laughs> and carry on, exactly, or you lose it. Um, yeah. Or it takes two hours to get your bag out of the carousel. How does travel impact all of this for you? I mean, and, and do you have this in the back of the mind when you're designing as well? Because yeah, everything mean, looks like it can travel. A, I always say I'm a lazy dresser. I don't want to overthink what I'm wearing. So I like things that I can, you know, I, it's a big challenge sometimes when I'm d traveling. and see how much I can pack into a carry-on. And a lot of the collection packs tiny. I mean, you can get so many clothes. I call it packables because literally, apart from the shoes, you can get, I, I had a carry-on and I had, I think, like 10 outfits and like three pairs of shoes. And because you can roll everything really tiny. Fantastic. And especially the silks, you know, and a lot of the things that are geometric, you can just f fold them flat. Yeah, exactly. And roll them up and they come up and they look fresh again. They don't take much care. The thing that I've always found fascinating, too, is that some of the best pictures in here, mm -hmm. you know, we're showing a lot of runway shots, but some mm -hmm. of your best photos are on people like Cindy Sherman, who is fantastic, but Cindy is not a runway model. Um, yes. Do you think that some of your clothes actually look better on a more mature woman, someone who feels really more at ease, or does it matter to you? Do you see it all across the spectrum? I think I see it all. It depends on the woman. It's the personality, to be honest, and I think Cindy's always been a great supporter. Um, my husband photographed her for, you know, the 15-year artist. We couldn't manage to get all the artists, but Cindy, 
some people were very, you know, over schedule, but she was so great, and it was so great to be able to photograph her in her home, in her working space. And, you know, she doesn't usually open the doors to that, so that's great. I love the connection to art, because I think one of the things that many designers, they're quite humble, they don't consider mm -hmm. themselves artists, but one of the nicest essays, and I'm forgetting who the person was that wrote it, um, was talking about you in comparison to Agnes Martin, one of my favorites, the great Canadian artist who at one point just sort of walked away from art. I think that meditative quality, Maria, mm -hmm. is maybe what they're evoking, because you don't say, I'm going to do, I'm going to make ball gowns, I'm going to make swimwear, mm -hmm. I'm going to make everything. You say, this is what I'm going to make, and it's almost as if your scope of work maybe is a little narrower, but it's very deep. Do mm -hmm. you think this is how you approach your work as well? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, I think female artists relate to the collection. I mean, a lot of them have said that. They think of me as a bit of an artist. I, don't, I never thought of it myself in that way. Uh, but maybe, you know, it's like wherever, you know, it's interesting pieces. I mean, Cindy says she has like 200 pieces. I said, well, when do you wear them? She <laughs> said, I collect them. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's, I don't know, I, I think um, it's a hard one to answer, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think, again, what I wanted to say, because we, we have been chatting for almost half an hour, it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like it. Um, Maria, for all of us, I think, again, for those of you who are interested mm -hmm. in true design, not just fashion, something that transcends fashion, this is the book for you. And I told Maria sort of an anecdotal story. Um, some of you may know the work of Betty Kirk, who did sort of the definitive monograph on the great Madeleine Vionnet. And she had a terrible time getting it published. It took her a couple of years. And it turns out the Japanese published the book. Finally, an American publisher mm -hmm. picked it up. And they are now in their sixth printing. And what they said to her is, nobody will buy a book with patterns in it. Well, I think we are going to prove that trend wrong. Uh, not only that, but also incredible sketches. And Maria did say that you wanted this to feel more like a sketchbook and not a coffee table yeah, book. Yeah, and, and I think you know the thing is that it's, it's about the evolution of, of an idea and how over the years it's become, you know, I have a, a design team and how we've evolved everything and it's, it's bec it became from something very small and how it's evolved and I think that's interesting. I think people have this expectation that everything is just born that way and it's instantly, per it's not about perfection, it's about an evolution and it's an ongoing evolution right. and, and right. always there's a chance to make things better, more interesting. I don't know, for me that's what keeps me going. Yeah. Obviously you still love what you do. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be happy and continue to see you working? And do you have anything that you have planned, like a book or anything else in the future for yourself? Oh, this was like such a, I think, I think my Your design child, huh? will kill me if I do any more projects. Uh, right now, no, just the book. And um, we're just trying to get through the book and the next two collection, working on two right now. and. It's, it's a lot of work, you know, and, and, yeah. and it's actually quite emotional to see everything. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's 20 years, and it's like, this is your life, this is what you've done for 20 years. It's right. like, and you can see, like, the evolution and, and, and people, you know, like the fact that Mr. Wong's leaving, so it's, it's another evolution, or something else will happen, you exactly. know. Exactly. That's great. Well, Maria, thank you so much. Um, I hope that there are some of you who have questions. I think Tanya and her team were... Ah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Ah, you definitely have your own distinct style, which is true. Who inspires you, other designers or artists? Uh, I mean, I'm inspired by art. Um, I mean, I, I'm friends with other designers. I think everybody has their own point of view. I, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm, I, 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 I'm, my inspiration, inspiration is quite instinctual. But when I was a student, what inspired me was like the fact that Comme des Garçons started, or Vivian Westwood. Those were the designers that I had on my pin board. Right. Two female designers. Right. Makes perfect sense. Um, this is always, I'm glad someone asked this. What advice do you have for a budding designer? You have to really love it because it's a tough business and you have to learn to take the good with the bad, the high and the low, and not take things to heart. I mean, 
it's hard because it's your work, but also, you know, I remember being 23 or 21 and having a show and getting really upset if somebody said to me, well, I love your collection, but, you know, your Italian factory is not shipping, so I'm not buying it anymore. Right. So it's, it's also having, you know, a good, you know, the good family behind, a support system to get things made correctly. Um, it's not just about the collection. There's so many moving parts. Yeah. I think also, Maria, you seem like someone who's so true to yourself, mm -hmm. and maybe that's the word of advice for a young designer going all the way through. Know who you yes. are and stick with it. Don't try yeah. to be everything for everybody yes, else. Yes, I think that's that's also, you know, it's, I, I think you have to know who you are. You yeah. cannot be. Exactly. Um, this one is good, too. Is um, How is your production process? Well, what is the production process of your design, beginning to end? How do you start and how do you end? Uh, well, start by picking fabrics. Uh, then we, we've just been doing this for fall, actually. The boards go up. The basic fabrics have to be recolored. The, the, the bones of the collection and you know like the fabrics are every season uh, then we pick what I call the eye candy the things that will make it look new again that get me excited when we go to a fabric fair and I go oh, wow that looks amazing and then we start designing like the prints the, the jackets all the exclusives because everything has to be exclusive now yeah exactly and thank you for this question. Uh, Maria does address the issue of sustainability in her yes. book. And this person asks, what is your view on the use of farmed fur? Um, what about faux fur? Uh, this is a loaded question because we do shearling because it's a byproduct. I will not do regular fur. I mean, when I was a student at war, I, I won a competition for mink, saga first. And I remember going to the ferries and I was really shocked. And, and that was a Harper's Bazaar in, in England, and I got a prize, and I should be really happy, but I was not happy about winning that one. So after that, the only way I can do is shearling. I will not do further. It's just farm for its skin, right. you know, as a byproduct. Yeah. It's like leather. The problem with a lot of synthetic furs is that they're highly contaminant, you know, the dying. Exactly. The, so exactly. in a way, it's, it's picking the lesser of the two evils and trying to, t you know, with the company more and more becoming more and more sustainable, we try and pick the better route, better, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, Maria really is a leader in this field. There's, uh, ethics is a really important component, and she does discuss it in the book, so thank you mm -hmm. for that question. And I've just been told I have to finish, so the rest of you can please uh, get your books, and Maria's here to sign them. She's also here to take any personal questions and speak with you. So thank you all so much for joining us. Maria, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.